This is Zeynep Varoglu, and she is a program specialist in the digital innovation and transformation section of the communications and information sector at UNESCO headquarters in Paris. What's somewhat more specific is that she is the one who is responsible for the implementation of the UNESCO OER recommendation and related OER dynamic coalition, plus the UNESCO ICT competency framework for teachers, as well as several other initiatives in the field of open and distance flexible online education. She also used to be the responsible officer for the UNESCO project, um, UNESCO Commonwealth of Learning Guidelines for OER and Higher Education, which some of you probably know. Today, she will talk about the UNESCO OER Dynamic Coalition, supporting the implementation of the OER recommendation. It's great to have you here. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Joran. I just want to clarify, I am not responsible for implementing the OER recommendation. We are all responsible for its implementation at a global level. I'm responsible for supporting the implementation of this recommendation. Um, I would like to share my screen if that would be okay. I, so I hope you see my screen, yes? We do. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you very much for this kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it's um, it's very it's a great honor. And I'd like to congratulate the German National Commission for this initiative, which is very innovative. It must be very tiring because it's twenty four hours and uh, and very timely. Um, today, I'm going to speak about the OER recommendation and the OER dynamic coalition. So. I would just like to I'll take you through the, the background, which I'm sure you know. I'll go very quickly and then talk about some of the, the act. I will talk about what we've done since it was launched two years ago. As you all know, the reason we do this is because of our overarching instruments, which is really the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Article 19, which calls for the um, for the right to receive and impart information through any media, regardless of frontiers, Article 19, and of course, 26, the right to education, and UNESCO's constitutional commitment to the free exchange of ideas and knowledge that supports sharing of knowledge using technologies. These are old documents for very current challenges. The recommendation looks like this, I'm sure you're aware. You know how to find it and because it's been a discussion all along. And it is a rare thing to have a recommendation. There's only been about 15. Now there's 17 or two more that were adopted in the last uh, general, uh, general conference. But it is basically a recommendation to member states on actions that they should take, that they would be invited to take in a certain area. While those are very soft uh, words, in fact, it's a very... Uh, it's a very important document because it actually brings the discussion, all the topics of a recommendation become part of the vocabulary of intergovernmental government, level and intergovernmental level discussions in a regular manner and basically forever. So this is really important. Um, that's why there hasn't been that many over the years because they don't come easily and they don't ever go away. So what does this say? I have to say, and I know you all know this inside and out, but I am obliged to put this on the screen. This is the definition of an OER. It is really on an open license. It's in the public domain and the license that permits no cost access, reuse, repurpose, adaptation, or distribution by others. It's not a free online resource. And that is something that's come up in the pandemic a lot. And it's something that we have had as a challenge for people to say, well, that's fine. You know, I'm using OER because I've got this free resource and it's free. I don't have to pay. It's not the same. And we have in the document the definition of an open license. And this, as you can imagine, every single word here was negotiated and adopted by consensus by 193 countries. So these words don't come lightly. And this definition is not some... It's not a detail, it is fundamental to the discussion that we're having. And what's come up in the pandemic, and I heard in Emma's discussion, the, the role of OER and the pandemic, what's come up in the pandemic is a real understanding of what the added value of those words are. 
because what's happened is that they've come across the 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 fact that the value of being able to repurpose, reuse, adapt, redistribute means that you can own it, that you it can be really your resource and you can use it for your own needs. And when your needs change, because that's the one thing that is sure to happen, thing change. When they change, you can re do it all. You can change it. You don't have, it belongs to you and you can build this, use this to build your own knowledge and the knowledge that you need for your own institution or government or your own learning objectives. Um, oops, there should be one more. How come it doesn't come? There we go. Um, the stakeholders are huge. It's a huge list. It's, as you know, from a educational perspective, it's much longer than the traditional educational list of stakeholders and the role of libraries is not also a detail the role of cultural institutions of publishers of media broadcasting bodies all of those every body in there is important because it shows that it's not just about education in the formal in the box sense it's about knowledge sharing it's about development and i think that i would really like to just highlight that What's inside? Uh, this slide has the sort of overview. I know you've been speaking about this for at least 24 hours now, so there's no need for me to go into it too much more. But I think I'd just like to highlight a couple of big points on each of these. In capacity building, and I'd like to underscore it, the capacity building one is 1A one on this recommendation. And the point is that you really need to have the capacity. It's about digital skills and it's about understanding the added value of OER. And that is the principle of being able to use it. Um, this, In terms of multilingualism, equality and inclusive, it has to kind of fit into no, the knowledge that's created has to be of quality, of course, but it also has to reflect the people that are using it. And the world doesn't speak English as much as the internet speaks English. And that is the multilingual issue is that it has to move to really where people are, what they speak, the language that are, is spoken by people, not just the language that's spoken by the internet. Um, also, 50% of our population, which is when we're talking like, I think when you do the math, that makes a lot of people of the entire globe has a disability according to the WHO. And this, I, excuse me, I hope the noise in the hallway is not bothering you. There's people talking. Okay. Um, the, this is important and it has to be accessible. And we're talking about online resources. It's completely possible to be accessible. Therefore, this shouldn't be so complicated. And quality, just because it's an OER doesn't mean it gets passed on being of not the same quality as a non-OER or any other educational resource, because that is the point of educational resources. They have to be of quality because they have a very big mandate. They're supposed to educate people to meet the challenges that are out there. In terms of sustainability, we can just bring it down to and boil it down to one very simple thing. It's about the fact, the principle that the end users and teachers don't shoulder the cost of the learning materials and the different strategies and incentives that can be used for stakeholders to use OER and also produce it. In terms of policy, now this one is a this one is really interesting because there is nowhere in this document that says that you must make one OER policy. It is the OER policy and that's it. It's the beginning and the end of the discussion. No, the document actually goes out and says it is part of a larger comprehensive system it can be part of other policies. It can be included elements that you put into your other policies. For example, procurement policies of an institution. If they mention the need for open licensing, well, that's actually promoting the use of OER and this recommendation, but you are not making the OER policy. It has to be part of something, part of the ecosystem of policies. It has to be well ingrained. Otherwise, it won't be, as, uh, as strong and it won't work as well. There's also the issue of incentives for teachers. And that is part of a larger discussion. And especially at the higher education level, this discussion has been going on for a really long time, I know, but that you know, higher education institutions promote research and publications, but what about OER development? Where is the role in that? There's also the fact that OER doesn't live in, an, in a bubble by itself in this open 
ecosystem, there is a thing called open access, open data, open source software, open science. And it would be, and this is something that's going on in, a, I mean, we saw at UNESCO, we had another recommendation that was adopted last month on open science. And this is an area that's, uh, there, there has to be links perhaps to support the growth of this idea of open licensing for knowledge of different forms. The fifth one is about making it collaboration between uh, and cooperation between institutions, countries, practitioners, and basically working together. Now, what happened to my screen? So this was the OER recommendation. I just went through it. We developed the dynamic coalition. The dynamic coalition was about sharing information and promoting collaboration. And we launched it, and you are very welcome to join the Dynamic Coalition. If you go to this link, you sign up, we will send you information, and we will invite you to get involved. Because the point is, it's the Open Educational Resources Dynamic Coalition. It's open. We really want everybody involved. We really do want to have the different, uh, have a diverse partner participation in order to be able to share what's going on globally for it to grow, it's, it's sort of to promote a snowball effect of the different uh, activities that are going on so that there's a, there's a resonance of the different uh, initiatives. Now, what have we done since we started? We've been really busy. Um, since 2020-21, we've had 70 member states involved in our activities. What we mean are people that work in governments uh, or have, are um, part of, um, or have institutions in different countries. So of all the countries and the institutions, there were 70 countries altogether that were involved in these activities. 57% of these people were from civil society and IGOs and from educational institutions and other types of institutions. 42% were from representatives of member states. They were not representing member states because this is not an intergovernmental forum it is an expert level but they were representatives for example of national commissions ministries of education ministries of communication and information what did we do we had a series of products and a series of events i put a really big a very summary summary of it on one slide of two years so in terms of events, we had two online consultations of the, of the OER Dynamic Coalition Roadmap. One was on the 3rd of March, which I think everybody can probably remember what they were doing on the 3rd of March, because wherever you were, the world was shutting down. And we decided to have a meeting anyway, because there was a lot of excitement. We said, pandemic, pandemic, what do we care? We're going to go ahead. And we did. And uh, we did an online meeting. And uh, I can tell you, I got into a lot of trouble because I said, okay, now we're online. Can we have a recording? And I was told, how dare you do that? You have to ask two weeks ahead of time. And so things have really moved ahead since 3rd of March, 2020. We had a second one in July in which we refine the roadmap. There's been eight bilingual OER Dynamic Coalition webinars. These webinars, I think some of you have spoken in them. I know Eva has been a speaker, I think. And there's been a number of speakers in these in this meeting who are there and who have participated. They're usually linked to an international day, for example, International Day for Persons with Disabilities or World Cup World Book and Copyright Day, etc. And they link to one of the aspects or several of the aspects of the recommend recommendation. Uh, we have had an online consultation on the uh, capacity building mapping exercise, three regional policy events in, in Africa focusing on West Africa linked one to uh, to a doc well, sorry one to a document that, to a project that Eva was mentioning with ICDE and the University of Utrecht in Eric. And we have had the honor of being invited to speak at a number of uh, partner events, including the OEG Global, and this one is uh, a great honor also, and a number of them. In terms of the products, there's been a mapping exercise and um, translation and contextualization, contextualization of a capacity building course, which was also piloted only two weeks ago. It's, uh, it was done in New Zealand through OERU, and it was translated and contextualized by UNESCO, ICDE, and the University of Utrecht Numerique, and with the, the Francophone Network. 
There's policy support for uh, regional work that's being done in West Africa. We produced a white paper also for this consultation. In terms of accessibility, we had uh, we were part of a larger project on um, done with the UN Partnership for Rights of Persons with Disabilities (UNPRPD), and we produced a number of documents in the form in the framework of this project, including one on accessible OER. I'm sorry, there's a typo on the slide. Um, and there is a study on blockchain that was produced that's really interesting. We're not really sure where we're going to go with it, but it is it does show that it has potential. And we've had eight bilingual, uh, bilingual updates. Bilingual um, when France, so our, for us, bilingual is English and French. Updates of initiatives of the OER Dynamic Coalition and that uh, we send out every month. And this is really quite good because we're able to, we're very thankful colleagues send us information on what you're doing, including this boot camp, for example, and we're able to share it with everyone else to try and get more participation in the different events that are being organized also by partners. This is some of the uh, the points that I was discussing earlier. Um, we had a really fun uh, webinar on World Book and Copyright Day that was uh, a discussion between the publishers, IFLA and Creative Commons. We did another thing for uh, Open Education Week. Um, the SAIL project is the Africa pro the uh, project being done through our UNESCO uh, Dakar office. And so you see, we have, we, there's been a lot of things going on. Um, to finally, to stop my, to finalize, to, to complete my, my presentation, I'd like to draw your attention to the slide, which I've been putting on my presentations for two and a half years now. And I really thought that it was going to be over a long time ago, but apparently so did everybody else. It was the idea that there would be a post-COVID-19 future of learning. But I don't really think that there's going to be a post-COVID-19 future of learning because it's just kind of like post means it's over. But it doesn't seem to be over. We're going into the third year. So this is the way it is. But that doesn't mean that we don't take stock of the lessons learned. And we don't uh, use this as a learning moment. And I think what's really important is that we have, for better or for worse, it has been really important for OER because the world has discovered that digital is no longer a luxury. It's just a necessity. And in terms of digital, there are different levels of digital and there are different things that you can do with digital. And in fact, there's this thing called open educational resources. And hey, governments called on on member states to work with open educational resources and they can really help to make this new new normal part of a foundation of best practices for sharing knowledge. So I am hopeful that good things are to come, but I hope those good things involve us taking, it, uh, taking account of the lessons that we've learned and that we're able to really use OER in a manner which will help us as a global society, as a planet. And with those great words of optimism, I'd like to thank you for your attention and your time.